Jeannie Gaffigan is the creative partner of her husband, comedian Jim Gaffigan. She's also the author of a poignant and at times very funny book about her recovery from brain surgery. It's called When Life Gives You Pears. Here is Jeannie Gaffigan. And the book, to my mind, tells a few stories. It tells the story of your marriage and creative partnership and the family you built with Jim. It tells the story of who you are and kind of who you want to be as a person. It also tells the story of your faith, runs throughout the book. And wrapped in all of that, of course, is the story of the brain tumor that you had, and then the surgery, and then the long road to recovery. But take me back to before you found out that you had a tumor. Paint a portrait of what your life was like. Give me the whole kind of lay of the land of Jeannie Gaffigan. Jeannie Gaffigan is someone who um, is busy all the time. And if I'm not busy, I create a reason to be busy. And um, it seems like it's something that is just falling in my lap, but I think that having that time away from doing it made me realize that, oh yeah, I seek out the chaos and try to organize it. It's some kind of like ego, like drug addiction I have about, or, you know, I'm addicted to um, pr producing, um, which is really great in a way, but in another way, it uh, makes sometimes life unmanageable. See, I just kept filling my life up with really fun work. That's well, it's an interesting tension in, in the book because, and, and we'll get to what actually happened to you, but there is this tension between chaos and control. And obviously a brain tumor is about as chaotic as, as it can get. And what happens, and you mentioned it, is that you are having trouble with your, with you can't hear out of one ear. Yes. Um, but it's not the only symptom you had. No. And like many moms I know, the last thing you think about is yourself. One of the things that I, I kept thinking about as I read the book was, you know, you have, you have these projects you're working on. You have five kids. You have two parents who are alive. When you find out you have this brain tumor, what is the first thing that you think, I could lose this? What if, I don't want to lose this. It was the whole thing. Yeah. It was the whole thing. And it was like, the first thought was, like, I don't have time to have a brain tumor. <laughs> like, I couldn't even put... Which seems put, a typical you thought. It was a typical me thought. Yeah. I was like... Can we, um, can we do it on Tuesday? Right. And then... Can we do it on Tuesday? Yeah. Like, can we do it before 9 a.m.? Because then my whole day will be a lot more open. And so I don't think that the reality of the situation hit me until I was in recovery. Because the really? idea was... I mean, and I chronicle all this in the book, yeah. is that I have this thing that will kill me if it doesn't come out, but it coming out may render me a very different sure. person who might not be capable of doing these things. But the first thing that we have to do is get it out or part of it out, because if I do nothing, I will die. That's the, the thing. So at that point, you you don't you can't run away from it. Well, one thing that... that happens, which I think anybody who's been diagnosed or thinks they have something serious has gone through, is that they call to make an appointment with a specialist, and somebody on the other line is polite, but they say, well, we can make an appointment for five weeks from now or three weeks from now, and that's what happened with you, and happened. then you happen to know a doctor, a, a neurosurgeon or neuroscientist who, who says, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, now that, I, now that you're telling me about this and you send the scan and everything, you need to see somebody right away, and you were willing to go along with it. You were willing to wait. You were like, well, that's what they're telling me to do. Without getting too political or anything, it made me think, like, what about the people who don't have friends who are doctors? Right, and that's why every step of the way, I acknowledge that I, I can't write, you know what, this is my advice for you if you have a brain tumor. Be married to a comedian. Right. Have like the, your spirituality is so intertwined from like some crazy mom that you had, and have a best friend, make friends when you're a little kid with a neurologist. <laughs> yeah, right. There's no scenario where you can put the ingredients in and come out with what I had. It just that's where my faith comes in. Faith runs throughout the book. You yes. you, you say I'm not. I don't want to beat the reader over the head with God, yeah. and you don't. But it's throughout the book. Yeah. But so is science. And yes. so help me understand how you 
bring those two things together. Because on the one hand, you're trusting the best doctors in the world, in New York City. Yes. And they are saving your life. They do save your life. Yes. Um, on the other hand, you're never without your faith. Because I would not have gotten to into those doctors. I really believe that, like, putting the call out to God, like, opened up doors that were just un... Like, I described the situation of how I got into the chief of neurosurgery. It wasn't like I was like, oh, by the way, my husband's a famous comedian. Can I skip the line and get in the back door of Madison Square Garden? It's like, there was no name recognition. Like, it was... I did find that interesting, that, you know, your husband is a celebrity. He will sell out Chicago theater, and yet... You're going through the same, for the most part, the same processes that anybody would go through. Calling, trying to get an appointment, hopefully hoping for some luck. Yeah, and I, I wasn't getting any luck. And when I reached out and I said, listen, God, I'm not getting anywhere. <laughs> all of a sudden, I've been I, trying, God. I've yeah. been trying on my own. I didn't so want to bring you into the, this. The thing about the science and God thing is that, like, what I described in my book is that I came from a situation where I had a really spiritual mom and a really like secular scientific dad. So I became something that's kind of like a mix yeah. of it. And so when my mom has something happen, she calls her like prayer people. When my dad has something happens, he calls the doctor. And I call both. And I believe that they work together. Has your sense of humor or what you want to laugh about changed? because of this experience? Yes, it definitely has. I feel like it's evolved rather than changed. Like, I feel like um, going, I feel like both Jim and I, when we write, it's a little bit deeper and darker. Like, we go to a little bit of a more dark place now. You know, there's less bacon, and there's more, like, colonoscopies. Yeah, which bacon can probably... Yeah, which, which is probably, you know, it, it's like an evolution. Yeah, that is... <laughs> From bacon, that's a natural evolution, yeah. bacon to colonoscopies. I want to ask you this question, which is, you come from a large family. You had eight siblings? Eight siblings, yeah. Um, you have five kids. Yes. Jim has a number of siblings. Six, yeah. Okay. Uh, nobody gets through their life without pain or without tragedy. When you're surrounded by so many people, the odds... They go up, right? You're going to encounter this. How does one go through the world and appreciate and experience the joy, but also inevitably deal with the tragedy? I feel like, and this is like a very, uh, very difficult concept, but it's really simple. Because um, you don't want to like live every day as if there's a tragedy around the corner. Right. But you kind of do want to live every day like there's a tragedy around the corner because... If you just are floating through life, like not like expecting anything to happen, that's really naive. For me, it's easy because it's still hard for me to swallow, right? So it's still for me easy for me to be really grateful about every drop of water I swallow or every time I, you know, smell my kid's head, I'm like, oh, I'm in heaven, you're here. Yeah. For me, teaching my kids things don't last forever. You know, people want to take kids and be like, nothing bad ever happens. I'll yeah, take right. care of everything. For you. But it's like some of the best thing you can do for a kid is be like, you know what? We're all going to die. And no one does that. And it's like every minute, every day is precious. Every single time you walk in the door, I just thank God that you walked in the door today. Because I'm not under the illusion that the brain tumor is like the last of the hard things that I'm through, but I'm grateful for it because I feel like it kind of gave me a heads up, like, oh yeah, this can all go away in a second. Jeannie, thanks for doing this Thank interview. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you.